to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In Romans 4, verse 3, the Bible asks, What does the Scripture say? We welcome you today to our study of God and His nature as it relates to sin. How does God feel about sin? What does God think about sin and, and, and things of that nature that we often see in the world today? And how does sin make God feel. Today we're going to be thinking about the nature of God in relation to sin and we're so glad that you joined us for our study of this wonderful subject from the Word of God. We hope that you've got your Bible handy. If not, that you'll go ahead and locate that as we're going to look to the Word of God together to see God's attitude and mindset on this subject. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship on Sunday or Sunday night or Wednesday. They'd be happy to have you for Bible study or worship. You'll find people at the Lord's Church who are just concerned about what the Bible says Christians are to do, what the Bible says we're to do, and how to live according to the pattern of the New Testament. If you'd like to have a Bible study or you've got further questions, they'd be more than happy to sit down and discuss those with you. Friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your spiritual journey. If you've got questions of a spiritual nature or if there's things that you're struggling with, we'd be happy to talk to you from the Word of God about those questions. And as always, we want to encourage you to visit our website thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our study resources. We have free videos and audios as well as transcripts of our lessons. If you'd like to have a copy of the lesson, you can download it from our website or if you need a hard copy, we can send that to you on DVD or CD free of charge. Just go to our website, locate the free media request form, and we'll be happy to get that to you in whatever format may be best for you. Also, don't forget about our app that we have now for iPhone and Android. That's a great tool to study the Bible, sometimes even on the go. You can download those to your iPhone or your Android from the App Store, and that would be a great tool as well. In this series of lessons, we're thinking about the nature, the quality, the character, and the heart of God as it relates to a variety of different topics. And today we're thinking about that in relation to sin. How does God feel about sin? What, what is God's thoughts on the subject of sin? And what is God's nature in relation to sin? Friend, let's realize this, that, that human thoughts and human wisdom alone, my thoughts and great thoughts of other people about sin, just really cannot adequately answer the question, how does God feel about it? We're, our job is not to give our opinion or tell what we think or what someone else thinks on the subject of sin. There's a way that seems right. That's not always the right way. Proverbs 14, verse 12. And in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And so we want to not tell what some person's opinion or other person has to say about this. We've got to look elsewhere to find the answer of how does God feel about sin. Let's realize that as we think about this subject, that in the Bible, God has a lot to say on the subject of sin. You know, as a society, we as a society, and, and sometimes even in the church, we sometimes become quiet about sin. We don't really speak up, and we're not as bold to say what God says on the subject of sin. But as we learn from the Scripture, we don't need to muzzle God on this subject. If any man speaks, 
Let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 11. And friend, as it relates to this serious subject, why would we ever want anyone else to teach us on the subject of sin except God? Let's let the master teacher, teacher tell us about sin. I remember the request of some of the disciples of Jesus and of John, of John in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. So Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. What a great question that is. What a great request. Lord, teach us. We need to let the master teacher teach us about sin and what the Bible really has to say on this subject. As we think about that idea, let's realize that sin is a reality. Whether I want to face it or not, and whether I want to own up to it and deal with it or not, sin is a reality that every one of us from time to time has to deal with. I want you to listen to the words of Solomon. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, Solomon said this, There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. You ever stopped and thought about that? I want you to think about the people you know that are really trying to live right. The people you know that are trying to go by the Bible. People that are good, moral people trying to live according to the Word of God. Even those people. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Even those people. All of us have from time to time have to deal with the struggle and the weight and the burden of sin. And so it's a reality that all men of an accountable age have to face. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let's also realize this about sin. Not only is sin a reality, sin is a sad reality of which man has no cure for. Not only is it something we have to face, but we don't have the answer to deal with the sin problem. Proverbs 30 verse 12, Jeremiah 2 verse 22, uh, the Bible will say, I want you to think about this passage in Jeremiah 2 verse 22. God said to the Israelites, Though you wash with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is ever before me. You ever really thought about man's cure for sin? You know, you can get all the soap, you can get all the Dawn detergent, and all the soap and all the cleaners and all the bleach and Clorox that you want. And you can't deal with the sin problem that way. You can wash as hard as you want and as long as you want. And it doesn't get sin off. Sin something that's not just on the exterior. It's something that stains man's soul. And so we've got to deal with it in a way God tells us. And friend, that's the good news. Although man doesn't have the cure... God does. And the wonderful news is, thanks be to God for His remedy for sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has the cure to sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 121 says this, You will call His name Jesus. He will save His people from their sins. John saw Jesus approaching in John 129, and he said, the, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so when Jesus came into the world over and over again, men realized the answer, the antidote, the cure for sin was available. And friend, God will pardon sin through Jesus Christ. Micah 7, 18, God is ready to forgive. Nehemiah 9, verse 17, He wants to pardon and forgive all men's sins. And as Isaiah 55, 7 says, God will abundantly Pardon. He's able to save to the uttermost those to come to Him through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7, verse 25 and 26. And so, yes, sin's a reality. Man has no cure for it. But the good news is God does have the cure through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, let's think about for a few moments the attitude in the heart of God as it relates to what sin is. In the Bible, God tells us what is sin? He clearly describes and tells us the nature of sin and what it is that separates us from Him. In the Bible, we might think of this in three different uh, verses that help us to understand this. In 1 John 3 verse 4, the Bible says that sin is a transgression of law. 
And we can relate that pretty practically. If I'm living in a county or I, I, I live uh, in a certain area where there are laws and I go beyond those, I'm in violation of those laws and there's liable to be penalty because of that. Uh, you can think about it this way. Imagine you're driving down the highway on a road that is marked 70 miles an hour and you pass a state trooper doing 90. Well, you're way over the speed limit. You have violated the law. You're in transgression of that. And as a result, there are liable to be, there will be probably uh, repercussions to that. Sin is transgression of God's law. In the Bible, when God tells us what to do, when God tells us, the right attitude to do it with. And when God tells us what He wants and we decide either not to do that or to do something different, we have violated, transgressed the law of God. Then in 1 John 5 verse 17, the Bible tells us what sin is from this standpoint. 1 John 5 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. So not only is sin a transgression or a violation of God's law, but unrighteousness, not doing right, doing the opposite of right, doing wrong, is a violation of God's will. Whether that be the speech that we use, and maybe not what God wants us to be, maybe our attitude is not right, maybe we're not doing the things God tells us to do, when we know what it is that's right and we don't do that, friend, that's a violation. That's, that's unrighteousness. And that's described in the Bible as a sin. But then there's a third one that sometimes maybe we don't think about. Not only should I, not, should I live according to the law of God and not transgress it, not only should I live right and not live in unrighteousness, but I want you to think about James 4 verse 17. The Bible says this, To him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him, it is a sin. Not only should we live according to the law of God and not violate God's teaching, but what about when I know what's right and I just omit doing that? A friend, knowing the right thing to do and leaving that out of my life, that's just as wrong. If I know I ought to help the poor, encourage the sick, uh, do what I can and I don't do those things, maybe I've not really gone out and actively violated anything, but if I don't do, what I'm supposed to do, I've omitted God's will in my life. And so realize that God tells us what sin is. Friend, also as you think about God's nature in relation to sin, let's realize that God tells us what sin's like. He describes the nature and the effect of sin. In Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, I want you to listen to the words of the psalmist as he describes sin from God's standpoint. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. And so when we think of sin, sometimes we think of it as uh, missing the mark, as it were. God has clearly told us where to aim and where to hit, and we fall short of that. Sometimes you may not be all the way out in left field or right field or be very, but we miss that mark. God tells us what to do and we just fall short of that. And so sin in the Bible is often described as missing the mark. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. In the Bible, sin is also described as a defilement. 2 Corinthians 7 1 tells us to abstain from every all filthiness and defilement of the flesh. Uh, you think of a defilement and you think of something that is just something you wouldn't want to have anything to do with. Imagine you get a piece of bread out of the, uh, a loaf, you get a piece of bread out of the bag and it's got mold all over it. Ooh, couldn't eat that. Why? It's defiled. It's not any good. It, it's tainted as it were. Sin is that defilement on man that God doesn't want anything to do with. It's opposed to His character and His nature, and so it's defiling to God. How else does the Bible describe sin? From God's standpoint, sin is a stain or a spot. 
James 1 verse 27 tells us that uh, the, the spot or the stain of sin can be clearly seen uh, in people's lives and we need to avoid that in every way. As you think about Isaiah 1 verse 18, God says, though your sins be as red, I'll make them, or though your sins be as crimson, I'll make them white as snow. Isaiah 64 verse 6, uh, our righteousness in and of itself is described as filthy rags. And as we said, James 1 verse 27 we become spotted, as it were, stained with sin. Think about examples of that. Imagine if you had a beautiful white garment, and on that beautiful white garment you spilled chocolate, or on that beautiful white dress you fell in the mud, as it were. It's stained. It's spotted. It's not pure and white like it ought to be. That's the picture. God wants man to be clean and pure and white. He's made that available through His Son. But sin is that spot or stain all over that white garment. Imagine a, a beautiful white garment. It's just got spots and stains everywhere. It's ruined, basically. Well, it can be cleansed, but it's going to take some effort. And so that's how God thinks about sin. Uh, the Bible describes from God's standpoint that for man's sake, uh, sin is a heavy burden that is sometimes too hard to bear. Psalm 38 verse 4, the psalmist said, My sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. You know, you can see the clear picture there. Man is drowning in sin, and it is a weight that he can't hardly lift off himself. The burden, the weight, the guilt of sin, the way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs 13 verse 15 says, and so when we think about sin from God's standpoint, God doesn't want it to be a defilement or a spot or a, a weight for us, but that's how it is. Without Jesus Christ, you're going to feel that every day in a life of sin. But friend, also realize God's nature demands that He also denounce, that He can have no relationship with sin and that He denounces it. Sin breaks the heart of God, Ezekiel 6 verse 9, and it does damage to His creation, and because of that, God has to denounce it for what it is. Psalm 5 verse 4 says, God has no pleasure in sin. He doesn't find any enjoyment or pleasure in it. It's not just a little bit fun to God. No, it's not the way it works. Jesus hated lawlessness, Hebrews 1 verse 9, and so sin and lawlessness, God doesn't find pleasure in it. Christ hates it, and friend, the sad news is there's no acquittal for sinners who live in that sin. Nahum 1 verse 3, there's not going to be a day where they're one day acquitted. There's not going to be a pardon if people don't deal with it according to God's way. There's not going to be a getting off easy or a get out of jail card free or something like that. And so we need to realize God's nature as it relates to His disdain for sin because of what it does to His creation and because it's against His very character. Habakkuk 1 verses 12 and 13 says, God is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and He cannot look upon wickedness. Now as you think about God, let's also realize what sin does to man and how man must deal with the sin problem. Friend, it's men, it's us that commit sin. The Bible clearly teaches that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There is none righteous, no, not one. As it relates to me and you, we're the ones who commit sin. From time to time, all of us of an accountable age have done things that we shouldn't. Sin starts with me. Uh, sin originates within man. It starts with inside and it comes out in his life, according to James 1, verses 14 through 16. And ultimately, that sin brings death to man. But sometimes man doesn't always deal with it in a way that God wants him to. Sometimes instead of dealing with sin in a God-approved way, we try to hide our sin. Friend, it is so foolish to try to hide sin from God. It's just not possible. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil, Proverbs 15:3. Sometimes we get this idea that if we don't know or if we act like it's not a big deal, nobody else knows and we just kind of sweep it under the rug, the sin problem will go away. Well, the problem with that is God knew all along 
And you're not going to hide sin from God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. You're not going to hide sin from God. Uh, Hebrews 4 verse 13 says this, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding good and evil, and there's nothing hidden from His sight. All things are, as it were, naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. I'm not going to trick God. I'm not going to put it in a deep, dark spot where God can't find it. You can't get away with doing that. It's foolish to try to conceal sin. Um, I want you to notice a passage from the book of Proverbs with me. Listen to Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 13. This really illustrates the picture so beautifully. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You can't hide it, but if we deal with it God's way, confess it and forsake it, then that sin can be dealt with. And so don't try to think you're going to trick God and hide your sin or, or that you can get away with it and nobody will know. God knows and God sees. And so the proper way to deal with sin is to acknowledge that sin, to confess it, and to turn from it. As we've said, all have sinned. You can be in one of two categories as it relates to that. You're either trying to live in sin, hide your sin, and conceal that from God and live the way you want, or you've confessed that and you're trying to do the right thing. Friend, it's important to realize this. When we say you've got to confess sin, sometimes even that leaves the wrong impression with people. The word confess does not mean, okay, God, you don't know this. But I'm about to tell, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. The word confess in 1 John 1, 7 and other places literally means to lay alongside of. Meaning God already knows what I've done. God already knows, here it is, and I'm owning up to and laying aside, laying aside of, laying beside what God already knows. And so it's the acknowledgement, the owning up to, I've sinned. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I need to turn from that. You know, when we think about sin, here's the attitude that we really need. I want you to think about an example. In Luke chapter 18, two men go up to the temple to pray. One of them is a Pharisee. He thinks he's everything God wants him to be, and he's really proud of himself. And then there's another man. This man has the right attitude, and this is the attitude we're talking about today. Listen to Luke 18, 18 13. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Friend, if you want to be forgiven of sin, you want to deal with sin the way God wants you to, realize, I need God's mercy. I am a sinner. I'm not perfect. I can't hide it from God. I need the blood and the salvation of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the few good things Saul said King Saul was found in 1 Samuel 26, 21. I've sinned. I've erred exceedingly. I've played the fool. David said it in 2 Samuel 12. Achan said it in Joshua chapter 7. And friend, I need to be big enough to own up to sin. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But do you remember the second part of Proverbs 28, 13? Whoever confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. Remember Numbers 32, 23 says this, Be sure your sin will find you out. Friend, I don't care how high you can climb. I don't care how fast you can run. I don't care how deep you can go. You cannot escape the consequences of sin. We've got to deal with sin in the way God tells us to. And that's what God wants. God wants, listen to this, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. As we think today about the nature of God and His relationship to sin, you can see why God despises sin so much. But we also want to leave, with you, leave you the impression today, the, the right impression, that God wants men to be saved from sin. And friend, no matter how bad that sin is in your life, no matter how heavy the burden is, no matter what the guilt may be, please understand today, 
you can, listen now, you can be forgiven of every sin you've ever committed and you can put it in the past. Let me, let me, let me illustrate that to you from the life of Saul of Tarsus. So I want you to listen to Philippians chapter 3 and I want you to think about what Saul of Tarsus says or Paul says about his past life. Listen to Philippians 3 verses 12 through 14. After he became a Christian, Saul of Tarsus would say, Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I, that I may lay hold of what Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If, if Saul of Tarsus could turn from sin, be forgiven, and, and reach for that prize of heaven every day. Friend, anybody can change their life and get right with God. If you're not a Christian, we're begging you today. Deal with sin in God's approved way. You say, well, what is that approved way? In Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up with the eleven on the day of Pentecost, and he preached the power of salvation in Jesus Christ. They believed in Christ. Acts 2 verse 36, they heard this. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God that has made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord in Christ. And they were cut to the heart, meaning they believed that and they're ready to change their life. Thus Peter said in Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you believe in Jesus, you're willing to acknowledge with your mouth that He is the Savior, the Son of God, would you be willing to turn from sin? Make up your mind, I'm going to do my best every day to live a life that's free of sin. And then would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? If you've never done that, we're begging you today, become a Christian. Put sin out of your life. God wants you to be saved. God loves you so much that He gave His only Son so that you could go to heaven. And, and friends, sin will never get you what it claims it's going to give you. Sin will always bring heartache. It will always bring problems. It will bring despair and discouragement and depression into your life. But with Christ, you can have joy and happiness and, and hope and you can live for and look for something far greater. If that's what you're desiring, you can have that in Jesus Christ. And we urge you today to do that as you obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.